Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything you give to us. I think especially for the gift of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, this opportunity to come and receive and return praise, worship the glory and adoration to you, and receive from you the font of all blessings, especially in the Holy Eucharist, the source and summit of our great faith. Bless our conversation this morning as we continue to learn more and unpack the great mysteries of the sacred liturgy. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Magdalene, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, great. Welcome to part two. Uh, we are filming today, just as we did last week. So to help us with the recording, if you need to get up to get some refreshments or go to the restroom, please go back and around, because you can see the camera's right here. So please don't walk in front of the camera, okay? So just go around this way, and then uh, that way we can have a good recording. This will also be up on YouTube, as is part one. So if you missed part one, you can go find it on our YouTube channel. Yes, Mary Magdalene has a YouTube channel. That's how my videos come out every Friday night, eh? or Friday afternoon. I upload them directly to YouTube. A lot of great stuff is on there, okay? So please feel free to check that out. And uh, if you're on there, hit subscribe, and then you'll get notified whenever we post a new video on YouTube. So uh, Nikki and I are doing a lot of great things on YouTube. So a lot of talks and things will get put up there as well. Continuing last week on the liturgy, I want to deviate a little bit and not just trek through the remaining parts of the Mass. I'm going to leave that for Dominic Bowie. What I wanted to do today is talk more about the technical aspects of the liturgy. For example, what do the different postures and gestures mean? How do we choose the texts that we do? What options are there for certain parts of the Mass? Because one of the conciliar reforms did expand the options that we can use. For example, in the extraordinary form of the Mass, there's basically one Eucharistic prayer. Now there are eight. Okay. How many of you knew there were eight? Great. Okay. There are some beautiful ones that they wrote in there. And four can be used generally all the time. And they have some prescriptions around their proper usage. Others are used for even more special things if you're doing votive masses or special celebrations. So that's where you get some there. We have two that are devoted, for example, to reconciliation. R1 and R2, they're called. We have various needs and occasions. We have, uh, so maybe there's more than eight. Sorry, maybe there's like 10 or 12 of these Eucharistic prayers. I think that's more accurate because you have only like. four in the missal. No, yep. there's all 12 of them are in the missal. Okay. Okay. In my missal, there are 10. So you, might have, so you might have maybe a smaller one, but this missal, the one that governs the usage of mass, right? This is a bit different one. This is a study one. So there's commentary notes in there as well. But the ones that we use for mass, there are, uh, 10 Eucharistic prayers that you can use, okay? Several of them are devoted for various needs and occasions, and there are the main four that can be used, okay? So we'll, I guess we'll just start with that, since we're on those. The first one is the Roman Canon, right? Eucharistic Prayer 1. That's the same one that was used throughout history. That is actually the oldest one, what we know. The liturgical documents in history, that is the most ancient of all of our Eucharistic prayers. That's the one where you list all of the names and all that, like uh, Peter, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius. How many of you know those were the first couple popes? Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, right? Then you get Cornelius, Lawrence, uh, John and Paul, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, Cosmos, and Damian. Those are martyrs, right? So you're listing the apostles, Peter, several of the popes, and then early church martyrs. You we're doing the same thing again with that second set of names, right? With John the Baptist, Agnes, Estelia, Anastasia, and all of your saints. Those are different martyrs from the first century, first and first through second century martyrs. So that that's why that's in there. It's recognizing the heritage, the great pedigree of our faith. That one can be used anytime, right? According to this book. There's so what I have with me today, I basically I have three books. Okay, that govern the liturgy and what we can do, what we can't do, right? So it's Father and the clergy's job and, and Chris Hobrock's job and mine. We get to read all these books. <laughs> Y'all can. They are available for free and online. You can find them there. But yes, this is the, uh, this is the Word on Fire uh, Constitutions volume of the Second Vatican Council. In here is the document Sacra Santum Concilium which is the, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. That's the first document that the Second Vatican Council produced, okay? So let's think about that in terms of the conciliar mindset. The liturgy was the most important thing, and so they wrote that document first. 
and that shaped and influenced every other document in the council. We'll get to that in a little bit, but um, the Eucharistic prayers right in here, the four main ones, one, two, three, and four. One can be used anytime, daily mass, Sunday mass. Two, Eucharistic prayer two, it's the shortest, it's preferred vision, it doesn't explicitly prohibit it, but it says the preferred vision, again, for the church is that this is used on daily mass. While it's permitted to be used on Sunday, the church doesn't really recommend it, and yet we've all probably known many priests that have used yes. Eucharistic prayer two on Sundays. <laughs> I almost never use Eucharistic prayer two on Sundays. If I do, there's probably a good reason for it. Most of the time on Sundays, I use one or three. That's what I would use. I will use four during ordinary time. Right? Three is one that can be used for daily mass or Sunday mass. It's recommending it. Four can only be used when there's not a proper preface. So basically, we can't use it during Lent. We can't use it during Easter and the whole Easter season because there are particular prefaces given with that. Four is a Eucharistic prayer that borrows from the Eastern tradition. So it's very much more, uh, it sounds like something you might get if you go to a Byzantine liturgy or an Eastern Catholic liturgy, you'll find it in that kind of style, which is why it can only be used on Sundays that, or days that don't have a particular pre uh, preface, right? So a preface is the, right, this prayer that starts, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, right? It is truly right and just, Almighty Father, that we give you thanks and praise. That prayer is called the preface, okay? I'm prefacing the Eucharistic prayer. A lot of those are beautifully written to match the theme of the day. So, for example, this Sunday, this weekend, we celebrate Pentecost. So there is a special preface on Pentecost. Because of that, because of the special preface, I automatically, by liturgical law, cannot use Eucharistic prayer for it. Okay, so sometimes the liturgy does dictate when certain ones can or cannot be used. Ordinary time, I can use Eucharistic prayer four. You might have heard me, right? I've, I've done that before. With the Eucharistic prayers, two does have its own preface. So it's envisioning that you use this preface and this prayer together. Just the way there, that there's a synergy between the two prayers. Two also does have an ancient tradition behind us, uh, behind it. It was written by Hippolytus, and so it's been abbreviated a little bit, but um, not Hippolytus, sorry, that's a Greek philosopher. No, it was, uh... anyway, there is a tradition that it was written by some in the early church, but it has been abbreviated a little bit, and it's what the text that survives to us, and that has comprised the basis of Eucharistic prayer too. So there is some tradition to that as well, okay? Most of the time, this is just personal preface, preference right so sometimes the church does permit preference and choice in the sense of you can use any of these texts so it doesn't permit me to make up my own eucharistic prayer it doesn't permit that i can't just wing it i can't improvise it there are very few spots in the liturgy uh two that i can think of where the church says oh yes improvisation is okay <laughs> the prayers of the faithful and the prayer to close the prayers of the faithful okay those are what can be improv other than that do the red say the black the reason I say that is because that's how the Missal is phrased, right? There are red rubrics instructions, right? Rubrics actually comes from red letters, right? I think it's a French thing, right? Rubric, right? I think, Liz, is that French, right? Rubric, something like that? I'm going to pick on Liz because I know she speaks French. But <laughs> ru is, rent, is red in French, I believe, and the brick is like the letter, right? So it's literally rubrics comes from the red letters, right? Red writings. And then the black is what Father actually says. So it's do the red, say the black. That's the common liturgical idiom right which is easy it takes a lot of pressure off of me as a priest i don't have to entertain i don't have to come up with something creative people much smarter and holier than i have drafted these texts and i just need to say them and let the church and her liturgy speak for herself so. yes again preference right it's it's they can do it okay so uh, a lot of priests tend to use Two on Sundays. I'm not speaking ill of my brother priests doing that, but that's just what they have chosen to do. But so, uh, what do we see in here first? Let's start with Sacra Santa Concilia. Okay, so this is the constitution that the Second Vatican Council wrote, and it talks about some things. First of all, 
I want to dispel the evil notion that Vatican II threw Latin out. If anybody tells you that, they didn't bother reading the document. Uh, let's see. Where is it? I was just reading it here. Oh, no. Wait, that was in... In this one right here, that was in the journal, that's where I was reading this, okay? Didn't cast it out. So, germ, general instruction of the Roman Missal, paragraph 41. Since the faithful from different countries come together ever more frequently, it is desirable that they know how to sing together at least some parts of the ordinary of the Mass in Latin, especially the profession of faith and the Lord's Prayer. Profession of faith is the creed. I believe in one God, I believe in God the Father Almighty, according to the simpler settings. Okay, so right here, right? This is why we chant so many of the different parts of the Mass. They talk about that, they encourage that. Different parts of the Mass in Latin, right? So Father's not just being cruel. We gotta understand the church speak, right? It it's interesting when people tell me or how vehemently people object to Latin. I want to challenge back and, you know, again, things Father can never say, but he don't want to. <laughs> I want to say, well, would they object to that part of the Mass being done in Spanish instead of Latin? So it's like, why do they hate Latin? I understand there's probably some baggage and some bad experiences in that, but the Council did not get rid of Latin. That is our heritage, right? That is who we are as part of our pedigree as Roman Catholics, okay? Uh, if you watched my video, this uh, the one that came out yesterday, talking about Pentecost, I remember for me, two concrete experiences were this universality of the church preserved through the Latin language really came home uh, to roost. The first was when I was in Guatemala. I spent 10 weeks in Guatemala learning Spanish on full immersion. I think I knew three words of Spanish going down there. Taco, cerveza, and Jesus, right? That was it. So the important parts. But I was going to Mass every day. And as part of that, knowing three words of Spanish, you hear Jesus a lot in the Mass, but you don't hear the other two words, right? <laughs> so I knew that one. But they would do parts of the Mass in Latin, and I knew those parts, and so I could pray. That's the beauty, first of all, of the universal structure of the Mass, okay? Therefore, that means that the liturgy is efficacious regardless of whether or not we can understand or fully comprehend every word, okay? I want to dispel that, too. The ability and the efficacy of the Mass is not contingent upon us clearly understanding every single word. So if you can't catch everything a priest is saying, maybe because they have a bit of an accent, that's not devaluing the efficacy of the Mass, okay? The Mass is not about you. I want to reinforce that. I talked about that a lot last week. It's not about you. To that end, I would challenge back and say again, what are you putting into the Mass? What are you bringing in? How are you letting the liturgy speak? Okay? The sound is a little dull that day, or it's not working in certain parts of the church, and you can't hear every word. You're not being deprived of anything in the Mass. Okay? The Mass is the Mass. It is not dependent. It is not contingent upon you or me fully understanding every word, right? This is what Guatemala helped me to, re to deal with and reconcile with. But when parts were offered in Latin, I was like, hey, I can join in. There's the beauty of the universal language of the church, okay? We are at Pentecost, and does anybody remember in Genesis, the Tower of Babel story? What happened at Babel, right? They built a tower, they tried to climb to the heavens and ascend to godliness on their own power. So what are we told was the punishment of that? That languages were diversified so that now they could no longer understand each other. <coughs> Think about Pentecost. Pentecost is the reverse of Babel. God comes down to us and enables us to understand him in our own language, but draws us into this oneness in both mission and certainly even in language. Does that make sense? So Pentecost is the anti-Babel. For us, the oneness in that liturgy is Latin, okay? In church speak and in all things that we do, that is our unity in diversity. Now, a lot of these norms, so this is particular, 
All right, this is the English translation of that. So this is a universal document, okay? So that means this governs the mass when it's celebrated in Polish, Italian, French, English, uh, German, Russian, Slavonic, whatever language it might be. There's translations of these universal norms in all the languages. So all of the church is taking care to promote Latin as a part of that, okay? So we want to get that on. This also gives different parts. Uh, we're talking about choices during the Mass. At the very beginning of Mass, right, we do the penitential rite. There are three options in the penitential rite. The most common one is the confidior, right? I confess to Almighty God. There's the, uh, there's another part that we, uh, we do all the parts, right? During Lent, we do the have mercy on us, O Lord, for we have sinned against you. Show us, O Lord, your mercy and grant us your salvation. That is option B. And then option C is, right, Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile sinners. Curie eleison, right? Lord Jesus, you give us yourself. Christe eleison, right? Those kind of things. By the way, Curie, Christe, Curie, that's Greek. That's not Latin. I'll circle back to language for a moment, okay? Greek was the original language of the church for the first like three or four centuries, okay? Greek was the universal language. It is plausible that Jesus and the apostles would have at least have a spoken knowledge of Latin and Greek because that's, they were conquered by the Romans. That's what you did, right? How many places where in English colonies, right? Throughout the world, right? That they speak English, India, Africa, so many of the other places, right? You just do it, right? It's part of the, part of the culture. Also, the Romans idolized the Greeks. They loved the Greek language. So if you wanted something to go universal, you put it out in Greek, which is why the entire New Testament is written in Greek. So if we throw out Latin and Greek, we're automatically throwing out our heritage. Okay, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Circling back to Pentecost. Hold on a minute. Circling back to Pentecost and the use of languages in the liturgy. This idea that we're one in the Holy Spirit if we have a Latin mass part and we do the Kyrie, we're speaking in our vernacular, there's also a Hebrew idiom in the mass. So that means in any mass we can be speaking as much as four languages. There is Hebrew in the liturgy. Hosanna, 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 right? Hosanna in the highest. That's a Hebrew term. So is the phrase holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Ancient Hebrew lacks the superlative. So in English we would say good, better, best. That's not how they say things in Hebrew. They say it, something is good on like a natural level. Okay, it's holy. If it's slightly more holy than that, it's holy, holy. If it's reserved to God alone, it's holy, holy, holy. So it's a Hebrew idiom. In English, it would make sense, holiest Lord God Almighty. But we kept that Hebrew idiom, again, in acknowledgement of where we came from and our heritage. Okay, so we have a Hebrew idiomatic expression in the liturgy, sanctus, kyrie, and then the vernacular parts, okay, in our language. That's kind of awesome to think about, right? That, that means really the same thing that we're especially going to celebrate this week at Pentecost, hearing it in all different languages, is still happening in the church. It still happens every Sunday. All of these languages. So I know I'm harping on this a lot, but I want to get this into everybody's heads that the church thinks historically, traditionally, right? She thinks differently than our world, right? The current trend in our world, at least in the last 60 years, is to think very socio-politically, but that's not how the church thinks. So part of doing liturgical studies, forming ourselves in church documents, is entering into the church's way of thinking. Right, I spoke last week a little bit about full machine and that sacramental worldview and the divine sense of humor to enter into how does the church think? She thinks very differently. And when we understand that, now all of a sudden we can understand why the church teaches as she does. For example, I'll hit on a little bit of a controversial topic. This whole thing, this whole movement and push that's still around, right, for female clergy it is not going to happen you're hoping for that sorry john paul ii close that down 
in four pages on uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, John Paul II. The fact that he can say anything in four pages is amazing. <laughs> I love John Paul, I love JP too, right? Brilliant mind. But he's a little bit of a, you know, wandering soul. If we want to go from Los Angeles to Tallahassee, we might stop over in Seattle and then down in Austin and back to Tucson and then to, um, you know, Olympia or to, you know, Helena. And we might go to New York for a little bit, then we'll come back to Kansas City. And then finally we get to Tallahassee, right? If you've ever read his encyclicals, you know what I mean, right? He's wandering around and weaves all these beautiful threads together. But he says it in four pages that the ordination of women cannot happen. It is dogmatically definitive. From a socio-political standpoint, a worldly perspective, that sounds cruel. If we enter church thought, where we see the church thinking relationally, think of it from Ephesians 5, from St. Paul's perspective. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay? If Christ is the bridegroom, who's his bride? The church. Why do you think we refer to Mother Church. Why are priests all of a sudden called Father? It's that nuptial imagery carried in. So if the church were to change her teaching, now all of a sudden we've distorted our teaching on marriage. Now you have two mommies and no daddy. So if we enter church speak, all these things make sense, right? So we have to think with the church. And all of a sudden that makes sense. There was a great uh, podcaster actually that I listened to that she actually brought up this point. It was great. Her name is Jennifer Fulweiler. I love her story. Great little Catholic mom. She's a convert from atheism. Uh, she writes computer programming just because for fun. She likes to do computer programming, right? So very much scientific. Um, she's written a couple of books. She's been a speaker, great Catholic speaker. Uh, she went from that, uh, from this atheistic worldview to very Catholic, converted. Her husband was cradle Catholic. Part of the reversion was together. Then they had like six children in eight years, right? Very Catholic, including her last two pregnancies. She had even with blood clotting and it was very dangerous and risky for her, but she was still open to life. Great example of what it means to be pro-life and trusting in the Lord in all of that, right? I mean, just fantastic story. And she was talking about that in one of her podcast episodes. And she went, when we think like this, it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense, right? It's that relational aspect. This is why, and this is seen at the cross, where Jesus says to John, behold your mother. Okay? A, this is an ancient tradition going all the way back to the apostles and the church fathers, the <coughs> apostolic fathers, that John is the archetype of the priesthood. Okay? So John stands there as the archetype of the priesthood, kind of that in persona Christi role. And then when he said, behold your mother. He's not just talking that now Mary is going to be his legal caretaker and guardian. Okay, it's not like that. Because it's actually the opposite way. John is now her legal guardian. And who is Mary to stand for? The church. Right? That beautiful deposit of faith. Remember last week I talked about we have a living witness to what happened on Calvary. It's Mary and John that represent the church in its entirety. That is the living witness of tradition right there. It's this nuptial imagery. And this shapes St. Paul's theology. That's why Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, wives be submissive to the husband. St. Paul's not telling you to be a doormat. What does submissive mean? It doesn't mean what we think it means in our modern 2024 socio-political context. The etymology of the word sub, meaning under, as in submarine, submarinas, right? What is the marinas, the sea? Mare, sub mare, under the sea. Sub, under, missio, the mission. Be under the mission. What mission are you being under in terms of a supporting role? The role of the husband. What's the husband's charge? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He died for her. What wife wouldn't want to be under that mission as her husband is dying for her, dying to self physically, spiritually, metaphorically, sometimes physically? Who wouldn't want to support that, right? That, a bit of a tirade and tangent while there's going on, but <laughs> does that make sense? So this helps us enter into church thought if we think about it. 
So now all of a sudden Ephesians 5 is ter- should now become something that's like, oh, if we don't like that in our modern sensibilities, to something, whoa, this is beautiful. Right? And we can see St. Paul's theology shining through. So Ephesians 5 is actually harder on the men than it is on the women. If we think as St. Paul thinks, the church. Okay? This is why we want to avoid the trap of segregating and separating our faith, right? We live in a culture that's very much in box mode, right? I'm in work mode, I'm in family mode, I'm in church mode, I'm in all these things. But that's not what the gospel is supposed to do. The gospel is supposed to enter into it, to sanctify every facet of a person's life. And the Second Vatican Council will speak about this regularly in Lumen Gentium, in its constitution on the church, in uh there's there's a whole decree on the laity called apostolicum actuositatum i gave a talk on that a few weeks ago for ocia um, and it talks about that the call of the lady and to bring the gospel into all corners of the world so this modality that we tend to live in where it's like oh no we're just going to compartmentalize that is contrary to the gospel it's contrary to the church speak could you imagine if the apostles had done that we probably wouldn't be here today if so many people in the church had thought the same way we do in this separation of this and this and this and this and putting things into boxes, we wouldn't be here today because nobody probably would have proclaimed the faith to us. The gospel would have stayed stagnant. So our refusal to keep the gospel at bay is going to benefit future generations, right? They're dependent upon us to continue our work of evangelizing and proclaiming the gospel. So it's super necessary. Also on Pentecost, if you look what happened. Pre-Pentecost, what are we told? The apostles were gathered in the upper room for fear. Out of fear of persecution, of hardship, of the Jewish authorities. They were sitting around. They were afraid. When John 4.18, perfect love casts out all fear. The love of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, poured out upon the apostles, got rid of their fear. And all of a sudden they leave the upper room and they go out to the four corners of the earth. So that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, a little tangent to help you enter into Pentecost this weekend. Think about that. Where do you need the Holy Spirit to transform your fear? To take it away so that the perfect love of Christ can compel you to go out? What areas am I hesitant in or resistant in. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Could you imagine if the apostles had just stayed in there like, oh great, this is a cool gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to sit here and chill. Right? So we're not called to isolate ourselves. Right? That means as Catholics we're not just meant to stay in a little bubble. It's great to have the support and to come back to community for bolstering and nourishment and refreshment. And that's primarily what Mass is. Okay, again, this Pentecostal, this Holy Spirit, this evangelistic modality of being church. means that we're out in the world throughout the week. And then just like a car that can't go anywhere when it's out of gas, we come back on Sundays. We're blessed and given graces and many gifts by God the Father in his abundant generosity. Our gas tank is refilled and we are sent back out on mission. Again, remember last week I talked about the end of Mass. Ite, Misa, Est. A second person imperative. Go. Like, get out of here. It's an imperative to get out. The mission has begun. Okay? So that's primarily what Mass is. That's the opportunity where we come back and we rest. And that's what the Sabbath is about. Tying that in. The Sabbath should be that day where we rest, where it's devoted to the Lord and to our primary vocation. Okay? Yeah. All right. We'll get back to that. <laughs> so, um, first of all, any questions on that? I knew you had a comment or question earlier. You had okay. Any questions on what I've covered so far? All right. So, we heard in this the ordinary of the mass. So let's make a distinction of the ordinary and the proper. Okay, the ordinary of mass 
are those parts of the Mass that never change, that are the same week to week, ordinary, right? They're in order. So what's part of the ordinary of Mass? The entrance procession, the greeting, the Lord be with you, right? There are options there, right? The love, uh, the love of God the Father, the un I, I can't even remember it now, again, <laughs> right? I can do it when I'm in liturgy mode, outside of liturgy, I'm like, oh, great. But, again, the church actually discourages memorization of her texts in certain circumstances, because sometimes they can be messed up. So it's like, do the red, say the black, and you read it right there. Now, that's not to say memorizing parts of the Mass are a bad thing, they're not, but that's why I have the Missal up there. It's like, yes, I know Mass, I've been doing it for almost 11 years now, I know the parts of the Mass, but I'm trying, I want to follow the Church's liturgy, right? I have it right there. But sometimes, like now, I forget. <laughs> right, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There it is, <laughs> okay? But there's another one. Uh, what is the other one? It's... Uh... Hmm. Again, different options. I tend, I tend to, again, there are certain, pre, uh, it's options that the priest can use. Anyway, there's different options, right? You can just say, the Lord be with you, right? You can do uh, all these type of things. I didn't go through this very well. I didn't mark it up before coming in. That's a problem. But anyway, so there's different options, right, in terms of the greetings, different things. There are four options. Three of them can be used by priests. The last one can only be used by a bishop, right? Peace be with you. It can only be used by a bishop, okay? Again, why? What did Jesus say to the apostles? Peace, I leave you, right? My peace, I give you. So it's that sign of apostolic connection. That's kind of awesome, right, if we think about it, that the church is connecting all of these things. Again, church not just thinking relationally thinks holistically okay we want to think holistically this and this are always together sometimes there can be a tension in that faith and reason right these type of things so the ordinary parts of the mass are those parts that never change the greeting the procession the creed although there are options on which creed we can use you can use the apostles creed and then you, we use the Nicene Creed. Currently, we are using the Apostles' Creed because, it, again, in the Missal, it's, it recommends that during the Lent and Easter seasons, use the Apostles' Creed. Why, Why the Apostles' Creed? Because of the connection of the Apostles, right? Journeying through Lent, watching the resurrection, and watching the mission and transformation of the Apostles. This weekend concludes the Easter season, right? Pentecost is the official close of the Easter season. So we conclude with the apostolic mission. That's not to say the Nicene Creed is terrible. The Nicene Creed is beautiful. But the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed came first. The Nicene Creed actually expands on that. That's a topic for another time. Like, because the Nicene Creed has all these assertions that are trying to combat the heresies of Gnosticism and Arianism. So that's why it says, like, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, or begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Right? All those things an Arian or a Gnostic would find deplorable, and they wouldn't sign. They wouldn't say. Therefore, we're like, yeah, great. Here's what it means to be Catholic. Here's what it means to be part of the church. Okay? That was the Nicene Creed. comes from the Council of Nicaea in 325, and then Constantinople in 381. So its full name is technically the, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, but that's a mouthful. So we just say the Nicene Creed, because the basis of that formulation is there. Okay? Again, that's a whole topic for a whole other lecture, right? Because Arianism is um, its a fascinating heresy that really hasn't gone away even 1,700 years later. Like, I can't you just <laughs> go away? So, uh, other parts, the ordinary of the Mass. You heard the profession of faith and the germ. That's the creed, okay? That's why it's called the profession of faith, right? Because it's professing a faith. It can also take a third form. For example, when we do baptisms during the liturgy, right? First, I ask the parents and the godparents of their faith, but then I ask the general congregation, right? What we know liturgically, that question format, right? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. That question and answer form, that's even older than the Apostles' Creed, is question and answer format, right? So it's pretty beautiful. So that's why we keep that around. It's like, well, yeah, do the questions. Why not profess it? 
it's that ancient, it's an ancient, ancient rite of coming in and doing that, even older than the Apostles' Creed. Notice, though, the formulation of those questions and the Apostles' Creed are almost word for word identical. So when they formally did it, they just took, well, here's what we're asking, let's just formally write it. Okay. Let's go through here and make sure I get it all right so we can get the chat. Okay. Yes. Penitential act can occur in many forms. The Kyrie eleison, again, with form C of the penitential rite. Right? You came to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. If you don't do form C, right? So if you do the confidi or the have mercy on us, O Lord, for we have sinned against you, show us, O Lord, your mercy and grant us your salvation. Then the liturgy prescribes. After that, then you do the Kyrie. So it's, it's kind of interesting looking through the liturgical documents. There's some ambiguity as to is the Kyrie part of the penitential rite or its own separate rite. Just, just fun technical inside Catholic baseball type stuff. But, well, because sometimes in certain parts of the Mass, like if we do, for example, a baptismal rite, it'll say you omit the penitential rite and then you go right into the collect, right? Or into the Gloria or into the collect. Um, other times it will say you omit this, but then you jump right into the Kyrie. But the penitential rite is omitted. So it's kind of like, well, where is it? Where is it hanging out? Where is it? So it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's, and I haven't found a definitive answer. I guess it depends on which liturgist you're asking to. So I just go with what the book says. Okay, great. We'll just do this. So. You do both together. So you do the penitential rite and the Kyrie if yeah. the Kyrie is not part of the penitential rite. So form C, you don't need to do the Kyrie again because you just said it. Right? You came to call the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy. You came to call sinners, Christ have mercy. Okay? So just different choices of the text. Uh, then we move in. Then there's the Gloria, the Gloria when it's prescribed, okay? So it's the ordinary, the Mass, outside of Lent, okay? We don't do the Gloria in Lent. <coughs> Why? Because it's a penitential season, okay? Or Advent, or Advent. correct. There, and Advent is more anticipatory, right? We're anticipating Christ's coming. So think about that, right? The, the, the fact that the church lays out these parts of the Mass, and then when they're missing, that should catch our attention. How many of us, honestly, when, we, when Advent and Lent hit, how many of us notice that the glory is missing, and have we ever made the connection of what? Right? Yeah. You've done it? Okay, great. Cool. Yeah, it's... it's Quite interesting, and I want to preface all this. I know that there's been a lot of people don't know the Mass, which is thank you so much for coming. I'm glad we can offer this. But I also do want to challenge you guys a little bit. All of the, these documents you can find available online for free. So yes, priests and clergy should have been teaching this over the last few decades. However, you guys also have a little thing called the Internet and can look these up. So it's not entirely incumbent upon the priests to teach you everything, or my staff to teach you everything. Y'all can look it up a little bit. Just get off of YouTube and go look at the germ or the Vatican documents, right? That's hard. YouTube is a time-sucking black hole, and Father spends way too much time on YouTube watching all these random things. But especially dad joke compilations. I love dad joke compilations on YouTube. So it's great. I have so many of them <laughs> so what's so there's the ordinary parts of the mass again those parts that never change the profession of faith the universal prayers right so the prayers of the faithful we talked about that last week then you go into like the our father right that's always there um, those are the parts that never change the other parts are called propers Propers can change week to week, season to season, okay? So the propers would be like the collect. Let us pray. Right at the very beginning of Mass. That changes week to week. Pay attention, okay? Except uh, during ordinary time. During ordinary time, 
they've taken the collect from that Sunday, and that runs throughout the entire week. So that runs Sunday to Saturday. So you use that. However, during Lent, during Easter, um, certain parts even of Advent and Christmas, that collect and the prayer over the gifts and the prayer after communion, those will change day to day, week to week. Okay? In ordinary time, it's just kind of, nope, we'll just use these. However, the church does also permit that if it's the 20th Sunday of ordinary time, Father can, if he wishes to, go all the way back to the first week in ordinary time and can use those prayers. So we can kind of interchange some of the prayers on a daily Mass, not on a Sunday. Sunday, you use the one prescribed proper to that day. So that's the, the difference, right? The ordinary is always there. The proper is proper to the day or the season, okay? So prefaces can be proper. There are proper prefaces. There was one last week that was just done for the Ascension Sunday. There's another one this week for Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, proper to the day. There was one proper to Holy Thursday, for example, was one. It was a little bit different than the normal prayer. Um, so they're propers to the different day. And all of this is done on purpose to show a unity of the prayers. Listen to the prayers of the Mass. They're not just, okay, it's Father's time to speak. Those prayers are connected to the readings and to all the other parts of the Mass. So there's my challenge for you as you're in Mass the next couple of weeks. Pay attention and see if you can find the connection between the proper prayers, the collects, the prayer of, over the gifts, the prayer after communion, the prefaces, and the scriptural readings, okay? Let's see if you can find them. The homily is an ordinary part of the Mass. As I said last week, homilies must be given on solemnities. What is a solemnity? A solemnity is every Sunday and holy days of obligation, and in the case of a uh, parish and their saint, their titular feast day. So for us, July 22nd is a solemnity because we are St. Mary Magdalene Parish. Okay? Or uh, if we were, was it January 30th, I think it's Thomas Aquinas. If we were at the parish of St. Thomas Aquinas, that would be a solemnity. Meaning you have the two readings, the gospel, the psalm, the gloria, the creed, all these type of things. Okay? Second to solemnities, then become feasts. Okay, so feasts are another degree of celebration. Feasts usually add the Gloria to the Mass. So we do feasts a lot of times on weekdays. They're not always, they're not always holy days of obligation, uh, but we add the Gloria on there. So that's how you can tell the different parts of, again, of the Mass. What's going on and what are we celebrating? The church is adding things to help delineate and show that something special is happening today. So we'll add the Gloria on a feast. Uh, then you have memorials, like mandatory memorials that the whole church celebrates. Below that you have optional memorials we celebrate. And then there's a commemoration. Right? Commemorations are a little bit different and unique in the sense that you have to use these. So commemorations kind of, I guess commemorations would technically be, be between feasts and memorials, a little higher. All Souls Day, for example, is a commemoration. Right? All Souls Day, you can use those prayers. I think you can even do, again, the church, through pontifical decrees and all that kind of stuff, the church has actually put All Souls Day forward as a great day that you can even do All Souls Day prayers on a Sunday, if All Souls Day falls on a Sunday. So it kind of like overrides a normal Sunday. It's very interesting, right, to think about that. So All Souls Day hasn't happened on a Sunday recently, and I still don't think it does this year. I think it's on a... Friday or Saturday, I think it's Saturday this year, but something like that, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting, again, all of this is governed in here, right, so there's tables of all that, all these things, there's another little book called an Ordo, that's, uh, any sacristans are in the back or have seen it, it's a small little book that tells you, today we're celebrating this, and you do this part, this part, this part, and this part, omit this part, and do these kind of things, so it's just a technical how-to thing, again, people smarter and holier than I have come up with these things, right, I've gone through that. So, um, and it tells you what color to wear. Tells you what color to wear too. Yes. Remember, we talked about the liturgical colors last week as well. So, um,
In here as well, it talks about postures, gestures, which parts to say, which parts not to say. One of the things that the council is big on, right, in this mode of full, active, and conscious participation, again, that doesn't mean that we have to say every word or sing every word of the songs, of the songs or the hymns. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be doing everything. It doesn't mean that. That's another phrase that's kind of thrown around. What exactly does that mean? Full, active, and conscious participation is actually not a conciliar conception. It actually came earlier. I believe it was Pius XI in the encyclical Mediator Day in the 1940s. Well, 20 years before the council, right? He wrote an encyclical, talks about that. And there, he speaks that the primary mode of participating in the liturgy is the ascent of the heart and the mind and the soul to God. That is the fullest degree of participation in the liturgy. It doesn't mean we need 15 extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion because, God forbid, communion goes more than five minutes. I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> I got a letter about that a couple weeks ago, so I just, it's kind of fresh in my mind. It gave me a good chuckle. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Also, just pedagogically, if you think about that, we want to rush Holy Communion. We want to rush this personal, intimate encounter with Christ. Usually they're rushing it because they have a tea time at the golf course or a dinner reservation. And I'm like, hmm, think about what you're doing. You're just saying that your dinner reservation or your golf tea time is more important than the Mass and the Eucharist. I also direct that to people that tend to leave early at the liturgy. I'm like, hmm, think about what you're saying. Okay? Think about what you're doing. What are you saying, communicating non-verbally? This is more important, so therefore I'm only going to allow this much time for God. God, you only get this much time out of my week? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Again, challenges. Sorry if this is like amazing people squirm, but my job is to challenge you a little bit, right? It's not just to be all fluffy and nice all the time. My job is to challenge you. Because these, these are the challenges I have been given that have helped draw me into the mess. Okay? Last week I spoke too kind of about my encounters in the seminary and how... All these things, right, these exposure to traditions and beauty in the church made me feel raw. Remember I said my two reactions were, one, this is beautiful, and then second was anger? I don't want that for any of you. So I have to challenge you and help you to think, again, in the mind of the church right, with all these things, okay? So, postures. Why do we sit? Why do we stand? Why do we kneel? First of all, it comes back to, and I spoke about this last week as well, the principle of the incarnation. When Christ became man, he gave us, right? He is the image of the invisible God, right? I think, is that the Philippians hymn, right? He is the image of the invisible God. Uh, I can't remember it now. I prayed all the time, it's in the breviary, and I can't remember it. So again, stage fright. You can't get it. Uh, performance anxiety, or whatever it's called. I don't know, but... Though he was in the form of God, Jesus not in equality with God, something to grasp that. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, right? So he's giving us this modality, right? We can see God. What does he say to Philip and to Thomas? The one who has seen me has seen God, right? So he's this image. Because of that, then, Christ is also showing us that our whole body is united in prayer. So we're sitting, standing, and kneeling, not just to give you a calisthenics workout, that might be an added benefit, but it's to help draw us into things, right? Because let's be real, when this happens to everybody, if we just were in one position the whole time during the Mass, if we were just sitting there, at some point, our mind might start to wander. We're thinking about this and thinking about that. Some of your minds might even be wandering now, when's probably going to shut up. <laughs> Won't be much longer, I promise. And then, so if, if, but if our mind's wandering, let's just think of it, let's play this out for a minute. If our mind's wandering, and all of a sudden everyone's standing up around us or kneeling, whoa, that's kind of jarring us back, okay? Whoa, what are they doing? Oh, wait a minute. That's what's going on here. Why do you think we ring bells, right? To try to draw us in out of our flights of fancy. Or, again, I spoke last week too about Pope Benedict and one of his things on the liturgy, the whole church should speak to 
this encounter with God, right, and this entering into the heavens. So this idea, our mind might be wandering, and then we go, ooh, shiny window. Ooh, that's Mary. Wait a minute. I'm in, I'm in a church. I'm in mass. Boom. Art has does, just done its job. That means that the shape, the environment, the building of the church itself has done its job. Because it's pulled you out of your daydream and brought you back to the mass. That's a good thing. So it's not necessarily even the distraction, the fact that our mind may wander, that's, you know, problematic. It's what we do when we become aware of the fact that we're distracted. I'm going to use an analogy from the first Top Gun movie. Right? Remember that fight at the end, right? It's kind of, I call it, your, I'll call it the maverick moment, right? That first, that, that last battle scene at the end where Iceman's in trouble and he's like, engage, Maverick, engage, engage, engage. And Maverick's like, talk to me, Goose. Right? Talk to me, Goose. He's like, he knows what he needs to do, but he's having trouble doing it. But then all of a sudden he gets back in, right? He's drawn back into the fight and then he engages and goes out. If our mind is distracted and wandering during mass and something catches our attention, if we allow it to draw us back to the mass, that's the good thing. That's Maverick coming back into the fight. If we just keep off and ignoring it and just, oh, talk, you know, not doing anything about it, we just lost Iceman, right? Not good. <laughs> so, well, that's your Maverick moment, right? That's, that's, that's the moment where we get in there. And that applies not just to the mass. That can apply to thoughts that can potentially be sinful, right? Can anyone here control what they think about 100% of the time? I didn't think so. Right? So therefore, because the mind just kind of naturally wanders off on its own, that's not necessarily sinful. It's what we do once we become aware that we're out of bounds. What do we do? Do we pull back in? Or do we just kind of let ourselves go? So if we're in the middle of Mass, we're all of a sudden thinking about our grocery list. Oh, I need to get eggs, butter, milk, you know, these type of things. Oh, and then i got to do this, and then i got to run this errand, and then i got to... Laundry done, sweep the floors, ma uh, sweep the carpet, mop the floors, you know, cook dinner, all this kind of stuff, we're gone, right? That we are culpable for. But if in the middle of mass we're like, wait a minute, I shouldn't be thinking about my grocery list. I'm in mass. No, focus, come back. That's not a sin, okay? If we're thinking about something maybe not so great, wait, I don't want to think about this. Call back in, focus on something else. It's interesting in English, right? And I've counseled this in confession many times. We have this expression, right, called train of thought. Well, think of a train barreling down the track. Trying to get in front of the train and say, don't think about this, don't think about this, don't think about this, don't think about this, don't think about this. That's like standing in front of the train and trying to stop it. Good luck. You're probably going to get run over. That's harder. It can be done, but it's a lot more difficult to do. What's easier? Jump in the conductor spot. And flip the switch. Get the train going down a different track. Right? Flip it somewhere else. Now, you've done the same thing. You've stopped the path where you don't want to go, but you've also done it in a way that's like, oh, hey, I can do this. So that might mean, wait a minute, I'm in Mass. Lord, help me to refocus on the Mass. Oh, wait, oh, I know this hymn. Or, whoa, there's the bell. It's the consecration. Jesus, I adore you. Boom, we're back in. Does that make sense? So that's part of why we do the gestures and the postures and all these things bring this long tangent back home. That's why we do the things that we do. It's this incarnational reality in the liturgy. That's also why we have the smells. It's not just because Father likes getting angry letters about how much people hate incense. <laughs> the smells of eternity. How many times have we read about lives of the saints, this odor of sanctity? That's incense. That's chrism oil. For confirmation of the baptized, right? All of these things that help us engage body and spirit, right? The soul yearns and the soul is capable of just hours, millennia, thousands of millennia, eons of just adoring the Lord, right? That's what the angels can do. Angels don't have bodies. They don't have knees that ache, backs that hurt, tummies that rumble, minds that are distracted, right? Senses that are like, ooh, shiny. They're drawing us over here. Angels don't have that problem. I shouldn't say problem. Angels don't have that gift. Laban. 
Remember what I've said in God's plan for hierarchy. Who's second to the Holy Trinity in God's plan of all of creation? Humanity. So it's the most Holy Trinity, us, angels. That's why people don't become angels when they die. That's an ontological downgrade. That's like going from first class to coach. How many people want that on an airline? <laughs> I didn't think so. I understand the sentiment, but please don't say that when someone loses a loved one. Don't say that. Again, I get the sentiment behind it, but let's be accurate. Right? I'm sorry for your loss. I pray for you. Like, let's commend this person to the Lord. Right? We pray for them. Acknowledge the pain, but also acknowledge the hope of the resurrection, that we will be with that person again. That's more comforting and consoling, I think. We, are, we were created higher than the angels. We were. It says, um, Letter to the Hebrews. Where? To which of the angels did he say, a body I have prepared for you? No. And we were made higher because the angels have not had Christ appear in their form. Angels, and, we are higher than the angels. It's hard to believe, but we are higher than the angels. Angelos, again in Greek. This is why we can't throw out Greek and Latin. They have great, in many ways, Greek and Latin are more precise languages than English is, okay? That's why in Greek and in Latin, you see different words for love manifesting different things. There's like a worldly affection or affinity. I enjoy this, I like this, and then I love this. We've lost that in the English language, and it's common for us, and it's okay for us to say, I love pizza, and I love my mama. We say that, and the tautology is that love is love. We're equating the two different forms of love. That's another horrible tautology in our world. Love is love. Not all love is the same. My house is burning down. I have a choice between saving pizza or mama. <laughs> I hope I choose mama. I should choose mama <laughs> over pizza, right? In Latin and in Greek, they wouldn't say that. They would say, I have great affinity for this. I have strong, I have strong affection or strong um, sentiments towards pizza. But my mom, just as she does for me, I would be willing to die and give my life for her, right? Agape, this is what Jesus means when he says, no, no greater love is a man, then he lay down his life for his friends. So angelos in Greek, again, the meaning is messenger. It means they are divine messengers. So each angel is also its own species. So Gabriel, Michael, Raphael are their own species. So the term angel refers to a denotion of function. They don't share a common nature like we do. We can say human nature, right? A substance, something substantial that's common to all human beings, despite the accidents. Accident doesn't mean what we think it means in modern English. Accident in the ancient Greek means characteristics that manifest the substance. So the accidents of a human person, hair color, eye color, weight, height, these type of things, right? Those are accidents, but they all manifest the same substance. That's not the case with the angels. There's Gabrielness, there's Michaelness, and there's Raphaelness, and there's Luciferness, right? and they don't share that in common. That's why the fallen angels can't be redeemed, because they each have their own different species. That's part of God's plan. That means that the angel Gabriel was created throughout all of history for that unique singular moment of visiting the Blessed Mother. That was his entire role in salvation history and in God's plan. It's pretty amazing. Right? Raphael, his whole mission of creation was to be there to appear to Tobias and heal him and drive out that demon. Right? That's the whole purpose of angels. I don't want to get too much more on angelology, but that's why we're there. Letter to the Hebrews right, is a great job of explaining that, that we are higher than the angels because Christ came for all of us, okay? So this incarnational reality, again, draws us deeper. In, did I get that okay for you? So my prayer is wrong. What's your prayer? You have made us slightly lower than the angels. He did not make us lower than the angels. Mm, so. when, it, when it talks about that, so it, it, scripture does mention that, right? For a while he right, emptied himself, took the low form. But if you read those, those references in the Psalms and in the scriptures, it might talk that on the surface level we appear lower than the angels, but in actuality it then say how God has raised man, right? After incarnation. No, even before then. Uh, Psalm 8, right? 
uh, how beautiful, O Lord, are the works of your hands, the moon and the stars that you have made. In wisdom and love you have wrought them all. And who is man that you should keep him in mind, mortal man that you should care for him? Yet you have made him higher than the angels. Mm. I think that's Psalm 8, right? Mm. That's Old Testament. That's pre-Jesus. That's B.C. <laughs> okay? Mm. Before Jesus. Um, isn't that why Jesus left? Because he didn't want Mary to be loved? Well, no, he didn't want... He, so um, what tradition tells us is that he saw the plan for humanity and he saw the incarnation happen and he saw humanity and he went, non serviam, I will not serve. Right, so he saw the incarnation and saw that, and yeah, ba I mean, basically, yes, he didn't like the idea that Mary or all of us, right, are higher than him. He said, I'm not going to serve that piece of clay. I'm not doing that. So he and the fallen angels, right? So that's the book of Revelation, right? It doesn't explicitly say the non serviam. Most of what we get about our angelology, right, the study of angels, comes from St. Thomas Aquinas, which is why they call him the angelic doctor. Um, so he gives us a lot about the hierarchies and all those things, right? Um, we actually have mention of the choirs of angels many times in our Eucharistic prayer, right? Thrones, dominions, principalities, right? All those things are part of the choirs of angels, right? So we're joining our voice in that, right? As without end, right, we acclaim, right? Through, with thrones, powers, dominions, we lift our voices as we pray. Sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Even that structure in the Latin, the three sanctus, 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 is the Hebrew idiom, right? Transliterated into different languages. They could say, um, what is it? They would say sanctissimus or something like that, right? So the, the greatest, holy, right? The most holy, right? Sanctissimus. La Santissima, right? In Spanish, it's the holiest, right? So it's there in the other languages, but it's not there in Latin. Um, okay. The other part I wanted to hit on in regards to this participation, we stand, we sit, we kneel. But there are also particular responses of the Mass that you guys should speak. And the church actually, in the Missal again, it says, while the, the congregation continues, or they say this. Meaning, Father is supposed to be quiet and let the people pray. Um, a great example of that is actually the Lamb of God, right? Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. In the Missal, Father's doing something else while the people are proclaiming that. So a lot of this idea, again, the conciliar vision, let priests be priests and let laity be laity and let their roles be distinct and defined, but collaborating in the sense of fulfilling the mission of the church. So that doesn't mean laity saying the words that father does or father taking the words away from the laity i can remember right the parish in high school where i was at the time there was the lady were saying the words of consecration and even trying to mimic an epicletic gesture right going like this i won't say which parish to protect them but it was not the phoenix diocese i will say that but that was an abuse right trying to do all these things let father be father right don't try to this is the same parish that tried to do substantial bread, where basically you have a huge loaf of bread like this, and you're ripping pieces off for communion, and crumbs are flying everywhere, and nobody cares. And I'm like, oh. I didn't know any better at the time. So again, imagine in seminary, I'm learning about the depths of the liturgy, and I'm going, oh, all of these things that were done, right? What were they done? They were done in the spirit of the spirit of Vatican II. I hate that phrase. I want to punch anybody that says that phrase. So don't say it. Because if the spirit of Vatican II is different than the spirit of Trent, different than the spirit of Nicaea and Constantinople and the Fourth Lateran Council and the Council of Jerusalem, that's idolatry. The spirit of Vatican II had better be in continuity with everything that has come before. That's what Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict mean when they speak about this hermeneutic of continuity as opposed to a hermeneutic of rupture. Talked about that a little bit last week, right? How in the 1960s, at least in this country, we threw out anything traditional and everything old is bad and outdated and everything new is great and wonderful. And we threw out tradition. That doesn't sit well with the church, right? That's how you had all this innovation after the council. And then you get other priests that try to come along and I'm like, 
it's not in the documents, or, you know, the priests are like, this isn't in the documents, we want to do this. Oh, but Father, this was so great and wonderful and beautiful. Yeah, but it's not according to the rubrics, <laughs> it's not according to the liturgy. Again, that philosophical principle of what are we doing when we're putting things in the church's prayer for the sake of anything other than the praise and worship and adoration of God, Okay. Again, there's whole rubrics legislating the choice of texts of all things, texts of like hymns, songs, antiphons, all these type of things. It's making sure that these texts are in order because we want to make sure that they're orthodox, that they're in union with church teaching. I don't know if I want to go down this rabbit hole, but I probably will anyway, just for fun. <laughs> Well, I can remember, too, again, in other churches, singing this hymn during the Mass, let us sing a new church into being. Right? Maybe some of you have heard that song done or whatever. Sing a new church into being. What are we saying philosophically? Why do we need to sing a new church into being? That this church sucks, <laughs> basically, right? <laughs> that this one is wrong. What, what are we trying to do, though? We want to sing it in our image. But also... The church wasn't born through song. It was born through the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why are we spitting on that to do this kind of thing, right? Praise the Lord, that hymn's kind of fallen by the wayside. But, does that mean, again, I don't want to get controversial. I don't want to do it. But, anyway, I'll just leave that there. So, I'll probably get in trouble now. It doesn't need it, but that's okay. So, <laughs> But the choice of texts matters. There is another law in the church, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. In other words, the law of prayer, orandi, lex credendi, the law of belief, lex vivendi, the law of life. How we pray is reflected in how, what we believe, and what we believe is reflected in how we live. So it's this unity. So if we're praying something but living opposite, John Paul II would call that, right, there's a disconnect there. We're not being honest. We're violating, is it the sixth, uh, seventh commandment? Thou shalt not lie or bear false witness, right? We're bearing a false witness. Same kind of thing that John Paul II talks about regarding theology of the body, right? And premarital relations, right? It's communicating this lie, something that's not yet done. So the choice of text matters, and all of it should fall into this church way of thinking again what is the liturgy the best way we can think about liturgy it is the representation of calvary we are standing between mary magdalene mary the mother of god no. and saint joseph and saint john and saint joseph saint john as christ dies on the cross it was a priest that said this in seminary giving a day of prayer and that just i mean that like flipped a switch for me in my mind of how I'm coming in and how I'm preparing for the Mass, how I'm participating in the Mass, how I'm doing all the parts that are necessary for the Mass. I was a laity at the time. I wasn't ordained yet, so therefore I was laity, even though I was a seminarian. They're still laity until they're ordained. But that, that flipped something for me. It drew the liturgy into greater context, into greater focus. Right? That if we're standing there at the foot of Calvary, Right? What are we going to sing? What are we going to say? What are we going to pray? Are we really going to want to leave early the sacrifice of Calvary? Right? What are we going to do? Right? I, I mean, so that is kind of the context, right? So that's more the technical stuff of the liturgy, uh, these type of things. So if there's anything else worth noting. Um, We'll circle back to this again. Okay, I mentioned the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. Paragraph 36, Sacra Santa Concilium, first document of the Second Vatican Council. Particular law remaining in force. Particular law refers to, you know, laws throughout different dioceses and bishops' conferences and that kind of stuff. The use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. Right there in black and white does continue, subsection 2, but since the use of the mother tongue, so that's the vernacular, 
whether in the Mass, the administration of the sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy, frequently may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. In other words, we can add to the vernacular. This will apply in the first place to the readings and directives. So imagine that, all of a sudden, this idea of bringing the Mass into the vernacular, paragraph 36 is saying, let's start with the readings. Let's start with the Word of God. Drop it into the people's local language. Again, that whole movement of mass parts in the vernacular was not unique to the Second Vatican Council. I was listening to a podcast, because his father does when he's not watching other stuff on YouTube, right? He listens to nerdy podcasts about the, the mass. There was this whole movement going all the way back, even into the late 1890s, in throughout the whole 20th century, culminating in the Second Vatican Council, this group called uh, Communion and Liberation, which is part of uh, Monsignor Romano Guardini. Romano Guardini was a huge influence on Pope Benedict XVI, so there are extensions of that. And one of the things they're doing is talking about reforms for the liturgy, right, in this spirit of continuity, including bringing certain parts of the Mass and certain rites, incorporating more of the vernacular into the Church's celebration of the sacraments. Part of this culminated as well. Remember Pius X, was it the 19 teens, lowered the age of communion to the age of seven. That's part of an ongoing movement. The Second Vatican Council does not exist in a vacuum. It's part of a context. And in that context that it's looking at these things and saying, yes, let's, let's go for it. That's why you can't just pluck it out and hold it up in isolation contrary to everything else. That's a, that's a great mistake made on both sides. People that want more reform in the liturgy and people that are super on the traditional side that try to deny the Second Vatican Council say it was a horrible movement. That's groups like SSPX, right? Or the SSPV, the Society of St. Pius V, which is really weird. But all these things that are saying the Second Vatican Council, right, is this non-binding pastoral council. No, 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 no. They're, they're making the same mistake as opposed to, oh, the Spirit of Vatican II, we can do whatever we want with the liturgy. The liturgy does not belong to us. Yes, liturgia comes from the Greek, the people's work. But what is the people's work? How many of us work just because we love to work and no reason for it? I didn't think so. Usually there's a reason to our work, to make money, to support our families, that kind of thing. Why, do we, why would we work mindlessly or without a goal in mind for the liturgy, right? So what is the people's work? What are we working towards in the Mass? Praise, adoration, worship, and glorification of God. That's it. Anything other than that pulls us away. That's why, I mean, yeah, I won't go to hell and touch that one. No, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> Got myself in enough trouble already, so I don't need to go over further. But, um, So, I think that's sufficient. We'll do some questions now. We have about 15 minutes left.